Wormwood, when I told you not to fill your tweets with rubbish about politics, I meant, of course, that I did not want to have your rather infantile rhapsodies about human death and the destruction of property. Insofar as the situation really concerns the spiritual state of the patient, I naturally want full reports. And on this aspect, you seem singularly obtuse. Thus, you tell me with glee that there is reason to expect a total race war in the town where the creature lives. This is a crying example of something I have complained about already. Your readiness to forget the main point in your immediate enjoyment of human suffering. Do you not realize that riots kill people? Or do you not realize that the death of the patient at this moment is precisely what we are trying to avoid? He has escaped the worldly friends with whom you tried to entangle him. He has fallen in love with a very Christian woman and is temporarily immune to your attacks on his chastity. The various attempts we've been making to corrupt his spiritual life have so far been unsuccessful. At the present moment, as the full impact of the political climate becomes clearer, and his worldly hopes take a proportionally lower place in his mind, full of vigils, full of the girl, and forced to attend to his neighbors more than he ever thought he would, and liking it more than he expected, taken out of himself, as the humans say, and daily increasing on conscious dependence on the enemy, he will certainly be lost to us if he dies tonight. This is so obvious that I am embarrassed to say it. I sometimes wonder if you young fiends are not kept out on temptation duty too long at a time, if you are not in some danger of becoming infected by the sentiments of the humans among whom you work. They of course regard death as the greatest evil and survival the greatest good, but that is because we have taught them to do so. Do not let us become infected by our own propaganda. I know it seems strange that your chief aim at the moment should be the very same thing for which his lover and mother are praying, namely his bodily safety. But so it is. You must guard him like the apple of your eye. If he dies, you lose him. But if he survives, there is always hope. The enemy has guarded him from you through the first great wave of temptations. But if only he can be kept alive, time itself will become your ally. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather. You see, it is so hard for these creatures to persevere. The routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair, hardly felt as pain of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which we have defeated them again and again, the drabness which we add to their lives, and the inarticulate resentment with which we teach them to respond to it. All this provides a wonderful opportunity for wearing down a soul through attrition. If, on the other hand, the middle years prove prosperous, our position is even stronger. Prosperity knits a human to the world. They feel that they are finding their place in it, when really it is finding its place in them. An increasing reputation, a widening circle of acquaintances, a sense of importance, the growing pressure of absorbing an agreeable work, build up in them a sense of being really at home in Earth, which is just what we want. You will notice that the young are less unwilling to die than the middle-aged and the old. The truth is that the enemy, having oddly destined these mere animals to life in his own eternal world, has guarded them pretty effectively against feeling at home anywhere else. That is why we must often wish long life to our patients. Seventy years is not a day too many for unraveling the attachment to heaven and fixing them firmly to the earth. While they are young, we find them always shooting off at a tangent. Even if we contrive to keep them ignorant of explicit religion, the incalculable winds of music and poetry, the mere face of a girl, the song of a bird, the sight of a horizon, are always blowing our whole structure away. They will not apply themselves steadily to worldly advancement, prudent connections, and a policy of safety first. So inveterate is their appetite for heaven that at this stage our best policy for attaching them to the earth is to make them believe that they can turn the earth into heaven at some time in the future through politics or eugenics or science or psychology or some such. Real worldliness is a work of time, assisted of course by pride, for we teach them to call the creeping death good sense or maturity or experience. Experience, in the peculiar sense that we teach them to give it, is, by the by, a very useful word. A great human philosopher nearly let our secret out when he said that where virtue is concerned, experience is the mother of illusion. But, thanks to a change in fashion and, of course, the historical point of view, his book has been rendered largely innocuous. How valuable time is to us may be gauged by the fact that the enemy allows us so little of it. A majority of the human race dies in infancy. Of the rest, many die in youth. It is obvious that to him, the main point of birth is death, and death is mainly the gateway to that other kind of life. We are allowed to work on only a selected minority of the race, for what humans call a normal life is the exception. Apparently he wants some, but only a very few, of the human animals with which he is peopling heaven to have had the experience of resisting us through an earthly life of 60 or 70 years. Well, there's our opportunity, and the smaller it is, the better we must use it. So keep your patient as safe as you possibly can.